Hi, Vicky. Hi, Shane. Are you are you a reader? Do you read? Is reading a thing you do? <laughs> reading is a thing I do. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I'm actually um, right now. Yes, I'm like super into reading right now. Actually, okay. I'm excited. Do you uh, do you do you like physical books? Like, oh, I know we talked about it, like oh. an e-reader, but no, I mean, do you yeah. like owning books, or are you more of a library person? Oh, interesting. So I'm somewhere in between. I forget. Okay. This is terrible. Don't. No Everybody here. close their ears. Yeah. Nobody listens to this. But I think um, I like forget libraries exist every once in a while. <laughs> and then I like find them again. And I'm like, oh, this is amazing. Like, I'm just so in tune sometimes to just like, I want this book. I'm going to buy this book. I want this book. I'm going to buy this book. That do it doesn't you, occur to me. Do you have to. a, like a card to your local library? Yes. Oh, okay. Okay. I do. And actually, probably illegally, I also um, have a, like, I share my mom's card. Oh. The New York Library. <laughs> sure. So. Well, yeah, you can do, you can okay. get stuff um, virtually or not virtually. You can get e-versions yeah. now. So that's, yeah, that's exactly. super helpful. Uh, that's really awesome. Yeah. My, um, my, my partner actually dislikes that I don't utilize libraries. I very oh, much really? appreciate having, she has a card uh, and uses it, especially the e-version. I like physical media and I like owning yeah. said media, specifically in the form of books. I like owning books, good books, bad books, like All crime, books. garbage, trash to really good works of art. I just want, I want Ooh. all the books. Um, Though I will say I do have a special place. Libraries do have a special place in my heart because yeah. uh, growing up, my mom actually worked at our school library <gasps> when I was in well, many grades, but specifically when I was in high school. That sounds so fun. It was awesome. I, I really, uh, I have to say, I really enjoyed having uh, a a parent in a school system who was not one of my teachers. I knew kids who <laughs> who had that, and that was awful. Uh, oh, sure. <laughs> this was more just my buddy and I would go to the library and we'd walk in yeah. and uh, her her colleague who was the head librarian would look at us and go, hi, Shane. Hi, Alex. And then just walk away because she knew that we were going to like hang out with my mom and not actually do anything. <laughs> uh, and it was just accepted that this was just, this is what we did. Yeah, I love that. And I like that, that maybe that's the... Like where Hi Shane originates. Oh, maybe. Did we just find it? Oh, I like that. <laughs> Science is fascinating. But don't just take my word for it. Join us as we hear stories from scientists for everyone. I'm Shane Hanlon. And I'm Vicki Thompson. And this is Third Pod from the Sun. While I love talking about my youth and I guess myself, uh, and will always use an opportunity <laughs> to say to say nice things about my mom, I of course asked you about libraries for a reason. A reason other than just making me super jealous that your mom worked at your school. It was pretty great. And my my goal yeah. was not to make you jealous. But if it did, that's just a bonus for me. Uh, bonus. No, no. The, in this in this specific instance, not to <laughs> not the uh, explicit purpose of right. making you jealous. Uh, today, we're talking with someone, hearing from someone who isn't necessarily a librarian, but does mm -hmm. work with and curates data at NASA to assist in some really important research there. Okay, so I'm imagining NASA has a does NASA have a library you could walk through and and peruse? Oh, that's a really great like question. Regular library? That would be so cool. But I bet this is much more electronic. This is a little bit different. And maybe even yeah. library might be a little bit of a misnomer. So uh, before I completely misrepresent <laughs> everything <laughs> we're gonna hear from today, let's get into it. Our interviewer was Ashley Hamer. My name is Michelle Thornton. I work at the ORNL DAC. So ORNL is the Oak Ridge National Lab. It's a DOE facility. And DAC is D-A-A-C. It's a Distributed Active Archive Center. <laughs> we can talk about what that means. 
and uh, my current role. So on paper, uh, I am a technical professional, but more broadly, I often say that I'm a geospatial data professional. Nice. Perfect. That's yes, that is many acronyms, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then just just to pile on it, D D O E, you said the Department of Energy. Department right? of Energy, yep. All right. Yep. Great. We've got it all we've got it all set. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Great. So so with all that that very long title, uh, what what exactly do you do? Yeah, that's a good question. And I get that question sometimes by people who really care about what I do. And I, I find that when I start telling them what I do. I see eyes kind of glaze over. So, you know, my elevator speech is, you know, we are a data library. So if you think about a library, you know, it, it's curating and archiving books and manuscripts, and it makes those books or that information discoverable. So we do that for data. So in other words, somebody can find data that they're looking for. They can get to it and they can have it available. So, you know, it's downloadable, it's accessible, it's discoverable, which is really important. We use the word metadata a lot. It's data about data, but that's a really important part of curating data is making sure that you can find it 20 years down the, down the line. So, you know, taking care of all of those pieces is what I and my colleagues do on a day-to-day -day basis. Great. Like kind of a high-tech librarian. Sort yeah. Of. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Great. And then just briefly, what, what kind of thing, what sorts of things is this data used for? Well, we are a NASA Earth Science Data Center. And so we archive data from NASA-funded researchers who are out there doing research, either in the field or modeling, or some of the data is from airborne instruments. Some of it's orbital, so satellite data. So what it's used for is anybody's guess. <laughs> so we are uh, invested in the biogeochemical community, so the terrestrial ecology uh, more generally. So that is our, our main focus, our main research focus. And a lot of our users are terrestrial ecologists, either in wildlife or climate change or you know, a whole host of, of sort of earth science in the terrestrial ecology program. Great. Yeah. So, you know, yesterday I got an email from a person who was doing research in Yellowstone. Last week, it was somebody from British Columbia who was doing studies on mule deer populations. So we definitely are very user focused. Um, and that means both in, in terms of people who are giving us data. So the NASA researchers who are, you know, once they're done with their research and they're ready to archive that data, we will interact with them on a, on a sometimes day-to-day -day level, understanding their data, standardizing their data, making sure it's documented properly. And then there's the user community who's using that data, who might have questions about it or need help. Yeah, it's a, a wide wide variety of, uh, of responsibilities yeah. there. Yeah. Vicki, would you, would you say that your job outside of Outside of the podcast, of course, because, yeah. yeah, but your job is user focused? Oh, definitely. I work with, so in my regular job at EGU, I work with. This donors. isn't your regular job? This isn't your number one job? Oh, it's Maybe in your heart? One in my heart. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, but no, in my regular, you know, my daily job at EGU, I work with donors to connect them to AGU programs. Um, to provide new opportunities for all AGU members. Oh. So I think that's pretty user user focused. I would say so. Yeah. 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 Mine is teaching fellow scientists or helping fellow scientists communicate more effectively. So look at us in, in both of our normal jobs. And then of course on the podcast, we're I'm just patting ourselves in the back now. Um, <laughs> it's a theme. I guess it is a theme. Uh, so in addition to hearing about kind of the user side of things uh, from Michelle, we were also interested in what got Michelle interested in science in the first place. You know, I can remember being in junior high and high school and just really enjoying my science classes. 
I remember doing a report, probably in elementary school, on Jacques-Yves Cousteau. And he was, uh, I think that period, Calypso and, and Jacques Cousteau was big in, in probably television programs and a lot of entertainment of that day. So I, that was that's very memorable. You know, as an undergrad, I did uh, go into science. So I have a bachelor's degree in biological sciences and minored in chemistry. And I, I have a secondary teaching certification. So I taught public school out of my undergrad and, and taught for several years. And I, at one point, I I felt like I... I wanted to do a better job as a teacher, and I, I didn't, I, I, the path for me to do that was to go back and do a master's degree. What I wanted to, to do more hands-on science, I wanted science to be more experiential um, for my kids, and I was kind of having a hard time making that leap. So I went back and, and did a master's degree. And during that experience, when I had to sort of choose what I was going to do for my master's thesis, GIS or geospatial work back in the early 90s was just becoming, it was becoming more accessible and more popular. And so I uh, approached my professor and said, that's what I want to do. And there wasn't a lot of that going on, especially in that lab, but he was very supportive of it. And so I designed my thesis around GIS and a little bit of aerial photography. Uh, and that was my introduction into the geospatial world and where I, you know, was able to find gainful employment <laughs> afterward. I mean, you definitely have one of those jobs where if like you wouldn't have been able to say when you were a kid that this is what I want to do when I grow up because it didn't exist, right? <laughs> it didn't exist in the form that it is today. Yeah, for sure. I know we've talked about jobs before, uh, but I don't know if if I know when you decided you wanted to or, or were going to get into the fundraising side of things. Yeah, I don't think we've talked about that. And I don't think anybody, I've never met somebody that decided they wanted to go into fundraising. Yeah, <laughs> so I feel like it's something. <laughs> I would love to see like the kid version. I don't even know what the kid version of this would be. Just asking people for money. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know either. But um, so I was really interested in nonprofits mm -hmm. and, you know, went to grad school for nonprofit management. And I think fundraising is just kind of like an easy -er way <laughs> to get, or one of the ways to get into working for nonprofits. Um, so I started, I, you know, sort of got my, found my first job um, in higher ed fundraising at a law school and sort of just kept moving along in that field the whole time. But my main interest was always in nonprofits. Gotcha. And supporting, yeah. you know, causes, worthy causes, right? Yeah. And it seems a pretty core yeah. component of being a nonprofit, that lack of mm -hmm. profit. It's in the name is needing right. to have at least money to keep the wheels going. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So every, all nonprofits need a fundraiser. So it's a good spot to be. Yeah, I didn't know. Uh, I'll talk about the podcast in particular, because this is a lot mm -hmm. of my job these days. But yeah, I I basically got nominated to be co-host of this when we first started mm -hmm. years ago. And okay. uh, it snowballed, I guess, in a positive way. And <laughs> here we are. And that is that is a longer story for another bit or another intro. Uh, yeah. But speaking of stories and interesting stories, we talked with Michelle and assumed that she would have some interesting stories as well. And then do you have any funny or memorable stories from your career? I mean, I can imagine maybe there'd be some really strange <laughs> uses of data that people are, are reaching out to you about, but I mean, anything you can think of. So I guess, you know, if I go back to sort of what what are my favorite you know, memorable stories. I think it was the brief couple of years that I was in grad school and really doing some, you know, hardcore field research. And uh, I was in Idaho at the time. I went to school at Idaho State. And, you know, we had field sites 
in southern Idaho on the Snake River Plain, and then we had field sites way up in northern Idaho. And it took a couple of days to, to get there, and we'd be in a big suburban and hauling a bunch of field equipment and often camping for weeks on end next to field sites and other sites that we had. I remember in the one of the most memorable field experiences I had was we had um, we were putting a chemical in in a small stream that deoxygenized the stream and it causes all of the macroinvertebrates or the bugs to kind of they'll just release themselves and float downstream as a as a way to escape that that pressure and uh, I was downstream with a couple of researchers and we had these little nets in the creek and we were catching bugs as they went by. And I knew that the chemical had been put in, but we weren't seeing any bugs coming down the stream. And I remember seeing a little caddis fly on the outside of the net. <laughs> I kind of popped it inside the net because I was worried we weren't going to catch anything. And I, I and the <laughs> researcher next to me said, no, you can't do that. <laughs> so, but mm. after a little while, our little nets that we were collecting bugs in just became overloaded with insects that were coming down the stream. And just seeing the amount and the the diversity of sort of the, that macroinvertebrate community in a stream with that kind of treatment was just phenomenal. So me poking that little bug in the net. <laughs> I didn't give I didn't give it enough time before everything really came downstream and started filling everything right. up. Right, yeah. a lesson in patience. Yeah. But you know, I like I'm glad I had that experience. I think it gives me um, a good you, you know uh, I appreciate how much effort goes into the field data that we often see the end of. You know, we see all the cleaned up data uh, at the end. But I I, I appreciate all of the work and logistics and energy that it takes to to get to that, you know, one file of results oftentimes. Right. And and hopefully that data doesn't have an extra <laughs> exactly. caddis fly in it. Right? <laughs> no, you yeah. can't do that. <laughs> so Shane, you've done some field work in your day. Mm -hmm. um, have you ever felt like you needed to fudge things during a frustrating experience or been tempted to? <laughs> yeah, I, I will say being being a published researcher, yeah. I have never fabricated data. Good. Uh, but I'm <laughs> I am positive that I've had points of exhaustion uh, or an exasperation. Um, but honestly, it may have been, if anything, like it probably would have been in the other direction. Mm -hmm. Not a oh, we need we need something versus we have too much. One of oh. my first research experience involved counting hundreds, maybe yeah. thousands of tiny plants and flowers in these pots yeah. in the middle of a forest mm -hmm. that was uh, full of mosquitoes mm -hmm. and was about, I don't know, humidity at around 90 some percent. So it was rough. Yeah, There was a point for a while that I hated plants. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, I feel like you were probably like, okay, we've got enough. We could go now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so definitely, definitely felt that way. Yeah. But if I'm being honest, that was a relatively small challenge uh, compared to right. some other bigger issues in science that are out there. What do you find is one of the biggest challenges in science today? Gosh, science in general or, or science in my world? <laughs> whatever. Yeah, whatever <laughs> pops out at you, really. Renewable energy, I think, is an important scientific topic right now. You know, being in Oak Ridge at Oak Ridge National Lab, we see a lot of um, different kinds of renewable energy research, and that's an exciting field right now. So I, I think that, you know, lessening our dependence on fossil fuels and, and those things that are contributing to climate change are important. What's next on the horizon? Oh, gosh. One of the fun things about what what I do and I think what science does is that there's always something new. So, you know, it is really a, a continually educating myself and keeping up on things. One thing that NASA is has embraced, especially this year, is um, an open science initiative and a cloud-based work environment. And so, 
that is challenging me and I think a lot of folks to better understand cloud-based file formats and access methods and, and in turn helping our users to be able to take advantage of, of that initiative. It's kind of a paradigm shift from from the download data to your you know work environment, your laptop or your workstation. Do your analysis you know on your laptop or, or personal computer, to you know being able to log into the cloud and access data there and do analysis you know using cloud-based infrastructures and platforms. But it allows it allows access to very large uh, volumes of data, so big data that a lot of that that's a lot of the breakneck that people find with some NASA data, especially the satellite data is that the the data volume is very large. So so those platforms are going to better enable researchers to uh, work with and analyze data. Well, Vicki, have you ever worked with big data? Oh, big data. It's like a um, quote unquote big data. Um, I'm currently uh, working on uh, a program like getting another master's degree in Ooh, data analytics right. and visualization. So I'm not, uh, I feel, I hesitate to say that I've worked with big data, capital B, capital D, mm-hmm. right? But um, but yeah, I have some data experiences. I mean, you're working with it. I, I yeah. When I was a researcher, uh, I worked with data, and mm-hmm. as I say, data, and you say data, and I don't. I think it's a tomato, tomato. Though, who actually says I tomato? The whole thing off. Anyways, you know, yeah, there we go. Uh, <laughs> but uh, never with yeah, capital B capital D data and and definitely not these days. My version of data is the master spreadsheet for this show. Right. (laughs) So yeah, not, not quite as um, uh, impressive, but really happy to hear from Michelle and want to thank her for sitting down with us. And with that, that's all from third pod from the sun. Special thanks to Ashley Hamer for conducting the interview and to NASA for sponsoring the series. This episode was produced by Jason Rodriguez and me with audio engineering from Colin Warren and artwork by Karen Romano Young. We'd love to hear your thoughts. Please rate and review us and you can find new episodes on your favorite podcasting app or at thirdpodfromthesun.com. Thanks all and see you next week. So I'm going to ask you about big data. sure. Mm -hmm. I got some. We'll see. Oh, I wish that was the take.